Well, good morning, everybody. We'll uh, go ahead and follow the bell and get started. Abba, Father, in Christ's name and your Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for sending the moisture to us to nourish the earth, bring growth and health. Holy Spirit, we ask that you be our rabbi today, that you would teach us from your living word, give us understanding and empowerment to live it. We thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. In Exodus 32, 26, uh, we see a moment of apostasy in, among the people of God. And Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who's on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered round him. Well, the, word, the word stood there is the word of mad, and it means to take one's stand, to endure, to present oneself as a servant. And he said, who is on the Lord's side? The word there means hand or strength or power. But the word that really jumped off the page to me is monument. It also means a sign or take part or have a share in something. But what we can see in this moment is that Moses became a monument unto the Lord. And there's no neutral reality. We know that. There's no secular world. One is ultimately for or against the Lord. And those who choose to take a personal stand as his servants become monuments in him who inspire others to draw others to him and do likewise. And that's key in our lives. And we're going to see through scripture. And originally I had a working title for this, No Middle Ground. But the more I was reading through the scriptures the Lord was showing me, uh, he kept showing me monumental moments and monumental people. And then that particular word jumped out because that's what it means in the Hebrew or one of the meanings of the word side. So we're just going to kind of take a few moments to look through this and understand how God calls all of us to be a monument unto him. As far as the English is concerned, our English word monument comes from the Latin monumentum, which comes from a Latin root, meaning to remind and in English, it's something that serves as a memorial, it's a work, it's a saying or deed that lasts and is worth preserving. It's a boundary marker. And so being monumental is of, relating to, or suitable for a monument, serving as or resembling a monument, massive or highly significant. So throughout the scriptures, we see many situations that prove to be monumental moments which reveal they don't create they reveal monumental people in the Lord as well as those who are not. And when I say by revealing and not creating is a monumental person is not created in a moment. That comes through a process of time. Joseph wasn't created in a moment when the door opened to the prison. That was a monumental moment when he stood before Pharaoh, but he wasn't created in that moment. He had been created and produced over years and years of hardship and honing and difficulty. So monumental moments don't create the person. They just reveal the person. Well, to be monumental, you have to have monumental perspective. And that's what the Lord gave Joshua, just making sure that his alignment, his sight was correct. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? The Lord Almighty does not choose sides. He is the side. And that's what he's telling Joshua. Now, Joshua loves the Lord, and he's completely loyal to him, but it was just a perspective shift that needed to happen. God wanted to make sure that Joshua understood that it's not about God joining his side. It's about Joshua joining God's side because God is the side. He is the one they're serving, and that's important. If we don't have this monumental perspective, everything else is going to be off-center. 
So it's not about God blessing what you're choosing to do. It's about you doing what he's asking you to do. And that's key. It's a monumental choice that we make in Joshua 24, 15. Joshua, understanding all of this, calls the people of Israel to question. If it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods of your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We've understood that Lord, when you see it in English, in all caps, you're reading the word Jehovah, which means self-existent one. He's uncreated. He, he is existence. So Jehovah's existence itself, thus your choice for or against him, determines everything about you. Because Jehovah is existence, your choice for him or against him determines everything about you. There is no neutral reality. So it's not just whose side you've chosen. And while God does demand the decision, he does not force the choice. You can either love him or serve him or not. Do or do not, it's up to you. Do or do not is what Joshua is saying. There's monumental distinction in Malachi 3.18. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Now, what we translate as see the distinction is ra'ah. And it means to behold, to look at, to perceive, to consider, to learn about, to distinguish, to regard. The time always comes when those who have chosen to, chosen to truly be loyal to Jehovah are clearly distinguished from those who are not. The time always comes. There's always that monumental moment. There's no neutral reality. God is ultimate. You're for him or you're against him. And so as, as the process of life goes forward, there will be times. It's inescapable when it's determined who's for him and who's against him. We see this over and over and over again in Scripture. We see it over and over again in our lives. And we're about to see it again in our day. I'm not a prophet. I'm not saying this is going to happen on this day in this way and this is what's going to happen. But I can tell you, according to the word of the Lord, there is a distinction that's about to be made. There's no neutral reality. There's no plain church. There's nothing in the middle. And so people are going to have to make a decision. There's monumental evil. In Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 11, there shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the death. Here's the deal. Harry Potter is not going to be in the kingdom of God. He's not going to be there. He's not there now. He never will be. It's a monumental evil against Jehovah for anyone to practice the magic arts of the rebellious gods and the spirits who hate him. And one of the things that we're seeing in our culture is, for instance, Harry Potter. I want to encourage y'all, if you're into Harry Potter, get out of Harry Potter immediately. It's completely evil. It's an intention from hell to try to draw people into witchcraft. And it's happening. It's geared toward children first, and it's seen as innocuous. It's just fun. It's just a story. We have theme parks with Harry Potter rides. It's completely from hell, and it is completely forbidden in the scriptures. And there are Christians who get deceived into it and think it's innocuous, and it's okay, but it is not, because what you're doing is opening portals from hell into a situation. You're harming yourself, you're harming your family, you're harming everybody around you, even if you don't intend to be. So it's a monumental evil, and this is something that ancient Israel dealt with often, and there's nothing new under the sun. We're dealing with it in our day as well. It's a monumental evil to practice the magic arts. It's disloyalty to God. There's a monumental exchange that happens here in Acts 19.19. 19. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and came to 50,000 pieces of silver. I did a little background on this to research it because I was curious what that would mean in current value. If the silver pieces were denarian, we don't know. 
the current value would be $1.5 million. If they were talents, it'd be $1.5 billion that they burned up. It was a monumental exchange. So that's, that's a lot of cost. That's a lot of worth, but it's, it's, it's worth it to get God. It's worth it to get salvation. It's worth it to be with the Lord. So God's grace is available even to witches and sorcerers, but they have to be willing to make the choice. It's the most valuable exchange they'll ever make. A monumental moment. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? And that's John 6, 70. And of course, he's referring to Judas. It's quite a while later, then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered him to him. Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. There comes a point when you can presume on God's grace no longer. If you will not decide for him, he will decide against you. Matthew 7, 21, 23, Christ talked about that. He said, there will come a point in time when everything and everyone comes before him. And for those who were loyal to him and knew him and were intimate with him, he will bless them through eternal life in him. But to those who chose not to be loyal to him, he will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. And so we can see that there was a grace given Judas, even though Jesus had his number, Yeshua knew, and he let it play for a time. He let him stay among the disciples. He was loving him. He was, he was teaching him. Jesus even washed Judas' feet on the night that he was going to betray him. I mean, there was nothing in Christ that was rejecting Judas. He wasn't treating him differently than anybody else. He was, he was offering him the same love. He was offering him the same grace. And we don't know what was going on in Judas' heart that he kept it closed and hard. But he, you can only presume on God's grace so long. And there comes a point in time when he's going to decide against you if you don't decide for him. It's a monumental action. In Mark 14, 8 through 9, she has done what she could. She's anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And that's happening right now. So Christ's prophetic word is being fulfilled in this room right now because we're talking about. It. Well, the word memory there is memnasunon, and it means memorial or remembrance or record. Any intentional action of love poured out for the sake of Christ is a blessing to his heart, and it never fails to stand as a monument to his kingdom purposes on earth. Anything and everything you do for his name's sake never ceases to go away. It's a monument of love toward him and for his heart. And Yeshua is the one who sees that that is perpetuated. It never goes away. It's a monumental action. Monumental prayers. About the ninth hour of the day, 3 p.m., and of course we've, we've talked about that. That's the Hebrew, one of the Hebrew hours of prayer. He saw clearly in a vision an angel of God in, came into him and said, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Same word in the Greek. In general, the Jews, as we know, look down on the Gentiles, and they utterly despise Roman military officers. And that's what Cornelius was. He was a Gentile, and he's a Roman military officer. So as far as the Jews were concerned, he was the scum of the earth. But the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. We know that from 1 Samuel 16, 7. Cornelius' prayers were viewed as a monument to the Lord in the heavenly realm. God would not forget them, and in his timing, God acted upon them. And so we can see that any heart, any heart that desires to be loyal to God is received by him. There are no barriers there. There are no racial or ethnic barriers. And it, Again, coming out of sorcery and witchcraft, if that's your heart and you want to turn from that, you want the Lord, he, he is quick to receive you. And here's one who's hated by the Jews, God's people, but God doesn't hate him because Cornelius had heard of Jehovah. He had heard of the one true God, and he desired to serve him and bless his people, and he's praying. And 
bless his heart, he didn't know he shouldn't be praying. You're a Gentile, and you're a Roman Gentile, and you're a military officer. You're the scum of the earth. You shouldn't be praying to our God. Bless his heart, he didn't know that. <laughs> he figured God wanted to hear his prayers too. He sounded like a great God, and the Lord did, and he honored those prayers. Monumental. Monumental clarity, 1 Corinthians 2, 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The word decide there is the word crino, and it means to judge, determine, separate, pick out, choose, select, approve, esteem, prefer. There's never been a more intelligent, educated, or anointed follower of Christ than the Apostle Paul. There hasn't been. <laughs> highly intelligent man, highly educated man, had the Bible memorized effectively, had studied theology for years, was at the top of his class. Nobody has ever surpassed this guy as far as religion, theology, study, memorization. It, 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 he was the top. And then to add to that, he was anointed in Holy Spirit at, at the highest levels. And yet, by his own testimony, he said the key to his successful obedience was making a clear and simple choice for Christ and sticking with it each day. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ, not religion, but the person of Christ. He's not following a religion anymore. He's following a person and him crucified. That's the message of his death and resurrection and what that's done for us. And Paul simplified. He just brought monumental clarity and focus with all the things that I know and all the knowledge that I have and all the verses I can quote for you and all the theology I can expound upon. I've decided, I've made a decision that I've reduced it down to this, Jesus and his message. That's it. And everything else is commentary. And that's how he lived his life. And that's how he was successful in serving the Lord. It's monumental clarity. It's simplicity. It's simplicity. The opposite of that, monumental instability. But let him ask for wisdom, verse 5, of a person needing wisdom, in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded, unstable in all his ways. The word doubt there is the word diacrino, and it's the opposite of crino to make a decision. It's to waver, it's to withdraw, it's to hesitate, it's to doubt, it's to be at variance with oneself. And you will remain monumentally unstable and at variance with yourself if you ask God for wisdom and guidance, but you won't continue to trust him in it and act upon it. And, and you all know when you encounter people like this, it's, it's a frustration to everybody around them. I deal with this in ministry often. People will come and say, I've got this need, I've got this problem, I've got... And, and if you go to scripture and you say, well, this is pathway in the Lord. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they don't do it. And then they come back a month later. My life is still in shambles. Well, did you do what God asked you to do? Well, that person is at variance with himself or herself. And they just keep, they're double-minded. They're unstable in all their ways. And there's a variance. And there's no middle ground. You can't live it both ways. So that's monumental instability. Paul had monumental clarity. That's monumental instability. A monumental extreme. When Moses heard it, he fell on his face and he said to Korah and all his company, in the morning the Lord will show you who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to him. The one whom he chooses, he will bring near to him. Do this, take censers, Korah and his, all his company, put fire on them and put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow and the man whom the Lord chooses shall be holy, the holy one you have gone too far sons of Levi reverence for God is not to be trampled upon and his patience does have limits it is possible to choose to go beyond the reaches of God's grace and be destroyed there you can go too far you can do it that's what Judas did. He presumed on the grace of Jesus, presumed on the grace of Jesus, presumed on the grace of Jesus. And there came a moment when the Lord said, enough, go do what you're going to go do. And the same thing with the sons of, of Levi. And this is Korah's rebellion, as you know. You, you, you keep pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. You can go beyond the bounds of God's grace. He can come to a point, and only he knows when that is. When it's too far, it's too much. You've, you've gone beyond. You're not coming back. I'm not going to accept you. And destruction came that day. That's a monumental extreme. 
a monumental shortcoming. That's going too far. You can also not go far enough. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him. And he was hoping to see some sign done by him, so he questioned him at some length, but he, being Christ, made no answer. See, Herod had desired to, desired to encounter Christ for a long time, but he hadn't acted on that desire. He had not taken it far enough. Thus, when Christ was before him, it was too late. Herod's opportunity was gone, and the Lord wouldn't speak to him at all. Christ had been taken to Herod for judgment, but it was actually Herod who was being judged by Christ's silence, and it was over for him. See, he, he had this desire. He'd heard about Jesus. He knew about him. He had access. He could have gone and, and pursued him. He could have gone to listen to him teach. He could have gone to meet him, but he didn't do it. He just sat back and waited. And then Christ is brought to him on this mock trial. And Christ is the one who's supposedly being tested and tried, but it wasn't he at all, actually. And so Herod was like, oh, here's my opportunity. He's right here in front of me. I'm going to ask him all these questions. I want to see a sign. I want to, hear, I want to see one of his miracles. And Jesus doesn't even look at him, doesn't talk to him, doesn't say a word the whole time he's there. And so here's the thing. And there's a difference between the Lord not talking to you and refusing to talk to you. Because you know, there are all times when we all feel a silence in the Lord. That's not the same thing that's going on here. That's not God refusing to talk to you. That may just be a relational silence where he's, he's wanting you to dig a little more deeply into what he's going to say to you. Now, I was talking with Walter about this, and a great example in, in my own experience is uh, our oldest son. We have four children. Our oldest son is, is pretty quiet most of the time. And we had a trip to Louisiana, just the two of us, to see his grandmother. And he was on leave from the Navy. And then we were uh, going down to Baylor to hear the choir. He was in the choir. Most of the trip, we didn't say much at all in the car because <laughs> he's just not a talker. When he gets ready to speak, then he speaks. And we may talk for an hour. And, and then when he's done, he's done. But it was never awkward. It, the, the silence was not a broken relationship. He wasn't refusing to talk to me. It's just he didn't have anything that he wanted to express in that moment. But we were both at peace, and I enjoyed being with him because the relational aspect remained the same. He loves me. I love him. We love being together, whether we're talking or not. And we have that relationship with the Lord as well. He doesn't always have to be telling you something new. He doesn't have to be dropping a prophetic word in your spirit every moment of every day. Sometimes he just wants to be silent and ride with you and just enjoy the scenery and just enjoy being in his presence and knowing he's there. That's different than him refusing to talk to you, which is what's going on here. A monumental mistake, Luke 22, 54, 55. Then they seized him, being Christ, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance, and that's key. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, that's key and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Now we know the story here. Peter did not stay completely away from Christ at this point, but neither did he follow him all the way into the priest's house. Thus he set himself up for failure by choosing to remain in the middle. He was neither hot nor cold, and Christ talks about that in Revelation 3, 15, 16, and it cost him greatly. For a time, he was not even con considered a disciple. And we know this because in Mark 16, 7, when the angel comes and speaks and says, go tell the disciples, he says, go tell the disciples and Peter. So in the heavenly realm, at that time, Peter wasn't even considered a disciple. Why? Because he said he wasn't three times. I don't know him. I'm not, I'm not a follower of Yeshua. I don't know the dude. Three times he said this. So his words matter, and he was disloyal. So in the heavenly realm, because Peter said he wasn't a disciple, he wasn't a disciple, and, but he hadn't gone beyond God's grace yet. And so the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter. And Peter was given another opportunity. And of course, we know Christ restored him. Peter denied Christ three times. Christ asked him three times, do you love me? He was reversing the curse. That's the, that's the love and the grace of God. But the monumental <laughs> mistake that Peter made was staying in the middle. Get in or get out, Pete. If you're going to follow Jesus, follow him all the way into the priest's house. Say, I'm one of his, or stay away like the other dudes did. 
they didn't put themselves in jeopardy by staying in the middle. Now, it wasn't great that they've all scattered, but they didn't make the mistake and put themselves in a situation where they denied him. They just ran in fear. Peter was like, I follow Christ, but I'm going to kind of go in partly. I want to know what's going on, but I'm not totally going to identify with him. And so I'm going to stay here in the middle, and it cost him greatly. A monumental deception, but a man, and we could talk about this in more detail. In my view, this passage is greatly misunderstood because Luke is writing, and when Luke talks about disciples, he's very intentional and clear in identifying them. Throughout the book of Acts, he talks about the disciples this, the disciples that. And you'll see in uh, Luke, excuse me, Acts 9, 10, 9, 36, and 16, 1, when he's speaking about specific certain disciples, a certain disciple was in Damascus, a certain disciple was in Joppa. And so by implication, it's clear that this man, Ananias, was not a disciple, and that's misunderstood. Because I've heard sermons on how God killed this disciple because of all these reasons, like the dude wasn't a disciple. Because there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 1. And we all sin, but this guy was wiped out immediately. Well, Luke is telling us he wasn't a disciple. He was just a man, but he was among them. He was a false disciple. He was among the disciples. But a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all those who heard of it. Of course, Peter's point was, he's saying, why did you do this? He said, first of all, you didn't have to sell the land. It was yours. You could have kept it. That's not sin. And when you sold the land, the money was yours. You could have kept all the money. That's not sin. Why, why did you devise this plot to sell the land, keep some of the money, and then bring the rest of it and act like you were given everything? Why did you do that? He said, it's a monumental sin, a monumental choice. And because he was not a true disciple, he was not in Jesus Christ, uh, this great judgment came on him, and there's a clarity that the Lord is showing. There's, you're in or you're out, but don't be a false disciple. Don't get among God's people and act like a son not. And he was unprotected because he wasn't in Christ. It's a monumental deception. And again, I'm not a prophet, but there's going to be a clarity that's brought. People who are false disciples and those who are true disciples, there'll be a cleansing in the church, there'll be a cleansing in the land that day always comes a monumental call because of that in deuteronomy 30 19 through 20 i call heaven and earth to witness against you today that i've set before you life and death blessing and curse therefore choose life that you and your offspring may live loving the lord your god obeying his voice and holding fast to him for he is your life and the length of days that you may dwell in the land that the lord swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. There's eternal life in Christ, John 3, 16, and there's the second death for those who are outside him, Revelation 21, 8. We, we studied this. We talked about this. Jehovah is existence itself. The only way continue to exist forever is if you're in him. If you're not in him, you can't exist. And so there will be a day when Yeshua reveals I knew you, I didn't know you. You were in me, you were not in me. Life, you do not have. So it's not about eternal good life in the Lord and a good eternal bad life outside of him. It's either you live in him or you don't at all. Now, hell is a real place, and it exists now, and people are there, but that, it's a holding cell. It's a prison, which is what the Word teaches. And there will be a day when everybody's released from that prison. They're brought before Jesus. The final judgment is there, and they experience the second death. They're, they're tossed in the lake of fire, and nobody survives that because it's the fire of God, and it destroys anything that's not of him. So there's a monumental call. I call heaven and earth against you, the supernatural realm and the natural realm. Here it is, life, death, blessing, curse, in, out, yes, no. 
you're in Christ, you're not in Christ. So there's eternal life in Christ. There's a second death for those outside him. Your choice regarding Christ determines your destiny, life or death, and there's no sort of life in the middle. A monumental day in Joel 3, 13 through 14. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The word valley there is the word emech, and it means a low tract of land, a wide extent, a broad depression between ranges of hills or mountains. And that is uh, metaphorically the case as well. When you think of a valley or a delta region, it's a low area, it's a depression between a mountain range or a hill range. And that's where people are. They're in a low place. They have to make a decision. The, the word decision there is charutz, and it means to strict decision, a threshing instrument, it's sharp pointed. And so when you think about the being in the valley of decision, you want to be in the mountain range. You're going to either be on the mountain of the Lord or the mountain of rebellion, but you've got to make a choice. Choose to worship the Lord at his holy mountain, Psalm 99.9. No harm comes to those who abide with him there, Isaiah 11.9. And finally this. A monumental life. A monumental life is what God is calling all of us to live. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write my name on him, the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven in my own new name. The word pillar there is the word stulos, and it means a column, a pillar, a support. A life lived in love and loyalty to Abba in Christ by Holy Spirit comes to stand as an eternal monument to the glory of God. And this life dwells in his presence to know and praise his name forever. The Lord, out of his love, is speaking to all of us. He's speaking to the world, and he's saying, I am love, I am life, I am grace, I am calling to you. And he does offer that grace, but his grace has limits. We can see that in scripture. You can go beyond it. He honors your no. If you're not willing to say yes, he'll honor your no. And there are eternal blessings or consequences to that. And the Lord is bringing clarity to that. And he's calling all of us to be monuments, stand as monuments in him. Monuments of his love, monuments of his grace, monuments of his truth, monuments of intimacy. That's what Moses was. He stood as a monument in the tent of meeting, and it was very clear who's on the Lord's side, who desires to be loyal to the one true God, or who wants to serve the lesser gods. And I'm giving you that choice. The thing that the Lord cannot do for himself, and he's ordained it this way. This is the way he created it. He can't give himself your heart, and he can't give himself your loyalty. That is yours and yours alone to decide. And he honors that decision. And he does that because when you do choose to be loyal to him, it blesses him because it's your choice. And when you choose to rebel against him, he honors that because it's your choice. And he cannot and will not force that because then it's not legitimate. It's not real. And so he gives you the grace to make the decision. If he doesn't offer you grace, none of us would choose him. If he didn't reveal himself to us, we wouldn't know him. If Christ didn't die for us, we wouldn't have this opportunity. But in Jesus, we do. And so he's bringing a simplicity and a clarity to us. It's not about religion. It's not about denomination. It's not about church attendance. It's not about any of the things that we've made it. It's who loves the Lord and who doesn't, who wants him and who doesn't, who desires intimacy with him and who doesn't, who wants to be loyal to him or loyal to the world. Those who choose him become monuments in Christ to represent him. And that you become point of clarity to someone else's life, like a Moses, like a Joshua, like an Esther. This is what it looks like to be loyal to the Lord. I can see this. I want what she has. I want her God. Cornelius saw that. I want this God. And that's what the Lord is calling us to. No middle ground, nothing neutral. You're in the Lord or you're not. You're a monument for him or a monument against him. 
Abba, we thank you so much for your living word to us today. And we realize, Lord, there is no neutral reality. There is no secular world. And you call heaven and earth. And your love and your desire is that we would choose life. You've told us, this is what I want for you. I want all to come to know me. I love all. I desire to love all. I'm a gracious God. But I'm also a just God. And I honor the decisions that are made. And so, Lord, we pray and start with me that anything in my life that is disloyal to you, that is not in the center of who Christ is, Lord, remove that so that my loyalty would be pure in Jesus. And, Lord, we pray blessing upon this ministry, Lord. You are raising up Beaten Bow Cornerstone as a monument not only in this city, in this state, but in this country, and even this world. You're raising it up as a monument to your glory and your name. And you delight in that. And so, Lord, I, I join with the prayer here and, and pray this. Lord, remove anything and everything that's disloyal to you that doesn't belong. And, Lord, you reveal these things to us not because you hate us, but because you love us. You want to pour out blessing. You want to pour out joy. You want to pour out life. You want to pour out abundance. That's who you are. And Lord, we know that you understand our shortcomings and our failures. And you're not asking for perfection because we can't offer that. But you are asking for loyalty. And we can be perfectly loyal being perfect. Our perfection is Christ and Christ in us. And Lord Jesus, as we humble ourselves each day and you grow within us and you transform us, we become more and more like you. And you raise us up as a pillar. You raise us up as a monument to your name and your glory so that people can clearly see your love, your grace, your wisdom, your kingdom among us. And that is our prayer today. In Yeshua's name and in your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you all. Thank you.